Okay, Firefly, roll camera. This is August Cayley with V-Log entry 184 at mission elapsed time, 23 months, 12 days, six hours, and 42 minutes. In three, two, one. Greetings to everyone back on Earth, Mars, and Lunar Base Aldrin. We're just 30 days out from our primary objective, Saturn's icy moon, Enceladus. And the view is, well, the view is incredible. Take a look. I'll be honest with you. It was a long 712 days ago when our crew began this voyage to another world. We first took space elevator Asimov up past the moon to our ship, Saturn One. From there, we left on a two-year journey to what I think is the coolest planet in our solar system. 152 years ago this month, Russian Yuri Gagarin became the first human to orbit the Earth, followed soon by America's Mercury astronauts in the early 1960s. Project Apollo carried eight crews around the moon until Armstrong, Aldrin, and 10 others stepped onto the lunar surface. Since those early days, space travel has become truly international, beginning with the space shuttle program in the 1980s. For nearly four decades, the International Space Station was occupied by crews from around the world. In the 2020s, we again ventured beyond low Earth orbit, first back to the moon, then to Mars. We continue to send both robotic and crewed flights even farther into our solar system. As we wait for the downlink from Enceladus, let's take a look at the gravity assist slingshot that boosted Saturn One's speed on its Jupiter flyby. By the time you see this, the crew of the Saturn One lander CERN will be making their final descent to the surface of Enceladus. This is it. What will we find when the crew lands? What we do know is that from the crew's first steps onto Enceladus, will come spectacular images, unexpected answers, and infinite questions sparked by the unquenchable human thirst to explore. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the chairman of the R. NASA Foundation, Mr. Adolfo Gonzalez. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Rotary International, the Space Center Rotary Club, and the Rotary National Award for Space Achievement Foundation, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to our 31st annual, annual, <coughs> annual Space Awards Gala. At this moment, let's take, I'd like to take a special thanks to our friends at the Space Foundation for that exciting trailer that you just saw by our very own Space City Films. That coming, that coming attractions trailer is for an upcoming giant screen format film, Voyage to Another World, now in pre-production. This year we celebrate to honor the accomplishments of Dr. John Mace Grunsfield, Rob Navius, and all the 2017 Stellars. The R NASA Foundation recognizes achievements in space across the entire nation and across all sectors, and we are incredibly honored to have so many visitors from all over the country here with us tonight. Now, I'd like to ask everyone to please rise and receive the Clearbrook High School Army Junior ROTC Color Guard, followed by Aaron Burton, Ava Kirchen, Matilda Smoley, and Talia Witherell of the High School for the Performing and Visual Arts Girls Chorus with the National Anthem.
Wonderful job, ladies. Thank you so much. Please be seated. I would like to take a moment uh, to recognize a few people in the audience, starting with the previous National Space Trophy winners. You'll find a complete listing of them in your program book. In your program book. If I could have the house lights, please, Marcus. As I call out the previous National Space Trophy winners here tonight, I ask that they please rise and remain standing while uh, they are acknowledged. Please help me welcome our, uh, from 2015, Colonel Robert Cabana. 2009, Dr. Michael Griffin. 2006, Colonel Eileen Collins. 2005, Dr. Glenn Lunny. 2001, Mr. Tommy Holloway and from 1993, Lieutenant General Thomas Stafford. Now I would like to acknowledge all the Board of Advisors. These are the leaders in the space industry from across the country that vote annually on the National Space Trophy winner. A complete listing of them can also be seen in your program book, and you might notice them wearing a red ribbon tonight. <clears throat> Previous National Space Trophy winners joined this illustrious uh, group of people, and we're very grateful to have them with us here tonight. So now I would I like to ask for all of our advisory members to kindly stand and be recognized. Our NASA Foundation was established by the Space Center Rotary Club in 1985, <clears throat> with the first, holding its first gala in 1987, with this year marking our 31st annual event. With the generous support of our sponsors, this event continues to be coordinated largely by Rotarians. The Space Center Rotary Club is one of many Rotary Clubs in District 5890. And tonight, we're very pleased to be joined by the Rotary District Governor, Dr. Eric Liu. Our goal, here, our goal here really is that everyone here feels like a distinguished guest and the foundation wholeheartedly welcomes you and sincerely hopes you enjoy this very special evening. Now, Reverend Medella Williams, senior pastor of the Taylor Lake Christian Church will give the invocation. Will you please bow your heads with me? Let us pray silently, together, each of us, according to our individual beliefs. 
creator of the universe, almighty and awesome God, Adonai, Allah, architect of being. In this circle of friends, we are blessed by your presence, grateful for all of your gifts to us as we gather here this evening. Let us give gratitude for our opportunity to serve Rotary so we might be a gift to the world serving humanity. Let us be a source of hope for those in need. With our friends beside us and the bonds of Rotary between us, with our goals before us and our dreams ahead of us, may the feelings of love, kindness, and a well-directed, gentle spirit always be reflected in our actions. For the fellowship and friendship that feeds our souls and for the meal that we are about to share that nourishes our bodies, we give thanks. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Madela. Well, I'm really excited about tonight's program. I'm excited about honoring Dr. Dr. Grunsfield, Mr. Navius, the stellar honorees, I'm excited about all the wonderful people here to present those awards. And naturally, we're very pleased to welcome back once again, Miles O'Brien as our Master of Ceremonies. An added note, tonight's event is being recorded live and will be broadcast nationally on NASA TV next week. The program will air on Tuesday, May 2nd at 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Central. So be sure to tell your friends, family, and coworkers and remember to set the DVRs. The RNSA Foundation's mission is to encourage, recognize, honor, and celebrate U.S. space achievement. And the members of the foundation truly appreciate the enormity of work that tonight's audience represents. So let me leave you with my sincerest wish to please enjoy your evening, enjoy your meal, enjoy your company. Cheers. With the invention of the telescope in the 17th century, humans were finally able to see a magnified view of the infinite space above our planet. In that space, we saw the colossal planets and moons of our solar system, the dazzling pallets of nebula and distant galaxies, and the darkness of the unknown. But most importantly, we saw potential. As our first and only true home away from home, the International Space Station has become the essential hub for multidiscipline scientific research in space. To further our understanding of the effects of long duration space flight on the human body, astronaut Scott Kelly and cosmonaut Mikhail Kornienko spent a continuous year aboard the station. The duo returned in March with data that will allow NASA to learn more about the effects of microgravity and radiation on the human body. The ISS is continuously occupied by an alternating international team of pilots, commanders, and specialists, whose work on station this year included the sequencing of more than one billion base pairs of DNA, advanced fire suppression experimentation, and several hardware upgrades. One such upgrade was the International Docking Adapter, which enables future crews to arrive via Boeing CST-100 Starliner and SpaceX's Crew Dragon spacecraft. As American commercial crew spacecraft continue development and grow ever closer to readiness, Soyuz remains the singular method for expedition crew change. In addition to six crewed Soyuz arrivals and departures, Several uncrewed agency and commercial flights delivered and returned cargo, supplies, and experiments to the station throughout the year. The Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA, successfully delivered six tons of cargo to the ISS with the H-2 transfer vehicle. The SpaceX Dragon capsule delivered the Bigelow Expandable Activity Module beam to ISS in April which was subsequently installed and inflated. BEAM is currently undergoing air quality checks, testing, and monitoring. In a hallmark return to flight, Orbital ATK once again launched the Cygnus capsule atop the Antares rocket, 
carrying 5,100 pounds of supplies and experiments to the ISS. SpaceX's Dragon cargo capsule visited the station three more times, also delivering necessary supplies and experiments. Additionally, the Falcon 9 first stage achieved its first ever landing on the drone ship PS I Still Love You in April, followed by five additional successful landings. One of those additional landings achieved another milestone when the first stage was reused to launch a communication satellite in March. Blue Origin's new Shepard capsule aced its first in-flight escape test, verifying earlier ground tests of the full envelope escape system. The same test saw the fifth autonomous vertical landing of the new Shepard first stage booster. Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 returned to free flight in December as preparation for further powered flights later this year. The Orion program continued development on the next generation human exploration spacecraft, surpassing multiple splashdown, parachute, and Pacific Ocean recovery tests. Orion's completed heat shield arrived at Kennedy Space Center in Florida, ready for integration with the capsule for 2018's Exploration Mission 1. Core stage fuel tank welding was completed for NASA's new heavy lift vehicle, the Space Launch System. Additionally, the SLS program managers completed successful testing of the solid rocket boosters and RS-25 engines that will power its flight. To prepare SLS at Orion for flight, the Kennedy Space Center underwent a comprehensive modernization review of upgraded launch pad systems and new platforms in the VAB. The Curiosity rover found chemicals in Martian rocks that suggest it once had more oxygen in its atmosphere. Curiosity also conducted an in-place study of active sand dunes, chose its own rock targets for laser spectrometry, and sent back stunning photos of the Martian landscape and the oddities within. The New Horizons mission sent the last bits of science data from Pluto and will now rendezvous with an object deeper within the Kuiper belt. The stunning images and important scientific data sent to us by New Horizons has fundamentally changed the way we view the ice dwarf and its newly discovered moons. In September, NASA launched the OSIRIS-REx sampling spacecraft that will rendezvous with the asteroid Bennu and return a sample in 2023. NASA also approved the Asteroid Redirect Mission's next phase of robotic design and development. Launched in 2011, the Juno spacecraft arrived at Jupiter on the 4th of July to study the origins of the gas giant. Juno will measure Jupiter's atmosphere, map its magnetic and gravity fields, and study the magnetosphere near Jupiter's poles. And finally, looking deep into space, the Kepler mission has verified thousands of additional new exoplanets, many of which are considered Earth-like. Tonight, as robotic explorers roam the surface of a neighboring planet and probe the outer reaches of our solar system, and human explorers conduct research and science just 300 miles above the surface of our planet, we pause to recognize and honor a visionary astronaut for his courage and commitment to reaching our goals in space. John Gronsfeld's five shuttle flights included work with the ultraviolet telescopes of the Astro Observatory and servicing missions to the Hubble Space Telescope, truly realizing the potential of mankind's invention of the telescope. We also celebrate the accomplishments of those dedicated men and women who dare to push the boundaries of space exploration, whose contributions have paved the way for the generations to follow, turning our dreams to destiny. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your Master of Ceremonies, Mr. Miles O'Brien. Hello, Houston. It is good to be back again and again and again.
You aren't sick of me yet, huh? One of us needs to get a new agent, because here I am on my ninth and record-setting MC for this event. I guess you could call me. Thank you, thank you. I am the, I'm the Peggy Whitson of MCs here. I've been doing this event since we began at the Waffle House in Webster, as you may recall. Uh, I, it's been so long, it's uh, one arm ago for me. Um, too soon? St is it still too soon for that? Actually, when I started doing this, Bill Shepard was still learning how to kill a man with his bare hands 16 different ways. Leland Melvin was nursing a tender hamstring while he was trying out for the Cowboys. Scott Parazinski was shopping for a surgeon seeking a height reduction so he could squeeze into a Soyuz seat. Wendy Lawrence was trying to smuggle in a doctored tape measure so she could fit in. She needed an extra half inch. In those days, woodpeckers seemed to love the space shuttle as much as all of us in the room. Steve Hawley had to show up at the 195-foot level with a bag over his head for here, fear that his epic launch scrub hex would continue. Up in space, the space station mirror was tumbling, burning, leaking, and brimming with junk, as well as CO2. And I was grilling poor Frank Cul Culberson on a daily basis on CNN. He still has scars and a twitch over the whole thing. Norm Thaggard was up there. He was on an involuntary th hunger strike while he waited for his spicy shrimp cocktail, which, as you may recall, was impounded by the Russian customs. You know, it was said at the time that a shuttle would only be cleared to launch when the stack of paper equaled or surpassed the height of the stack itself, documenting the million steps in the shuttle flow. In fact, I know this for a fact, the only stack bigger sat on Rob Navius's console in Mission Control in the White Ficker. Some things don't change. In those days, John Grunsfeld was in Russia thinking about flying to the station. When he came home to Houston, he packed empty cans and bottles in his suitcases so he could recycle them. That's not a joke, that's true. Anyway, Grunsfeld eventually said yet to Russian, or maybe it was the other way around, and the rest is history. He came back to become the world-famous Hubble repairman. So, what next, Columbus? How do you write a new chapter after that one? John has been tirelessly driving his Prius around the country, well below the speed limit, so the engine never kicks in, trying to answer that question. It's a long way from the Corvette days of the right stuff, right? He, um, he thought about that day when he was at the White House, and President Obama told the crowd not to confuse him with the Maytag repairman. Now, John misunderstood that. He thought that was an order for the Commander-in-Chief. He tried it for a while, but the problem was he got fired because he insisted on repairing the appliances in a swimming pool, underwater. Didn't go well. So, he moved on to being an auto mechanic. He tried his hands at that, but he kept working on engines that worked really well, full blast, for eight and a half minutes. And then they'd shut off. People apparently did not like the Miko feature, which he was trying to patent. So he remembered how much he enjoyed the view on his work site in orbit. He took a job washing windows at Trump Tower in Midtown Manhattan. I don't know if you've heard, but it's huge. After the election, unfortunately, he was forced to tender his resignation, having been at the Obama White House at all. Sad. Very sad. So, he had another idea. Get a little closer to his astrophysics roots. He went to a hobby shop and tried his job, uh, tried his uh, uh, hand at um, selling Celestron telescopes. But that didn't work out either because he kept trying to convince people like that to buy a package of home servicing missions. And people got a little creeped out by it. All of this led him to the brink of despair and ultimately a desperation move. My sources at the Goddard Space Flight Center sent me these security camera images at the James Webb Telescope. The stowaway attempt was foiled, fortunately. The judge sentenced him to life, a sentence of hard time in 1G, forcing him to abide by Newton's laws. Here, fourth. Of course, the truth is, the honest to goodness truth is, John is a national treasure who helped make this country great, 
long before that was a campaign slogan. And we thank him for that. And I am proud that I got to know him along the way and give him one of many rounds of applause we we'll give him tonight for his accomplishments. Now, tonight we honor John, uh, as well as many individuals who have made outstanding contributions to our space program. Our stellar awards go to 25 individuals and seven teams. All the stellar nominees are listed in your program. If you see them, congratulate them. I do want to point out that John Grunsfeld is the 31st winner of the Space Trophy. Our Space Communicator awardee is only the 11th recipient. So I ask you, which award is more prestigious? Just throwing that out there. The idea was hatched by a man who you're about to hear from. His dad and his Skylab crewmates once held the endurance record that Peggy Whitson just grabbed. For them, it was 84 days. But their dried poop, still stored here in Houston, near the moon rocks, has set some other kind of record. I don't know what it is, but it's still there. Ladies and gentlemen, a great space communicator himself, Jeff Carr. So thanks, Miles, I think. I can't tell you how pleased I am that Chris Hatfield couldn't be here tonight. Um, I, I like Chris, but Otherwise, I would not have had the honor of introducing the Space Communicator winner um, this evening. Uh, where's Floyd? Floyd, back in 1996 and 97, when we were first contemplating this award uh, in memory of Stephen Govain, the person that we're honoring tonight crossed my mind several times as we were working through the qualifications and the qualities of candidates for this high level of recognition. And, and I really truly hope that many of you who have, you know, been uh, veteran attendees at this event have uh, appreciated the quality of winners that we have brought to this program over the past 20 years, including household names like Miles O'Brien, um, like Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, Bill Nye the Science Guy. Um, you know, we've also recognized leaders and innovators from NASA and industry like Elliot Pullum and uh, uh, Veronica McGregor, media standouts like Mark Corot and Bill Harwood, and of course our astronaut poet himself, Chris Hadfield, uh, who won this award two years ago and nominated our winner uh, this evening. Tonight's honoree, Rob Navius, fits this award to a T. Throughout his career as a journalist and as a professional spokesperson, Rob has found himself in front row seats to the sum of the most dramatic, impactful stories of our times. And from his beginning as a cub reporter, he recognized and readily accepted the responsibility to connect others with these key moments in time, accurately, honestly, and with integrity. And over the years, Rob has developed a rich talent for telling a story in very compelling but concise terms. And I think that's really Rob's calling card, his trademark. Um, you know, when I had the opportunity to hire Rob back in, was it 93? Yeah. Um, we were looking for ways to improve the storytelling quality of commentary and, and other ways to better connect with the public. Uh, things like uh, broadcast innovations with NASA television, uh, educational programs, and we really, really needed to shake things up. We really needed to set the bar higher. And uh, Rob was the guy. Rob was the guy we needed. And he was, he was interested and um, you know, we, we took, took the opportunity to bring him on board. I have to say though that it, it, it was not a popular pick with everyone. Um, you know, I, I, I still stand accused by some today, probably in this room, of hiring Rob as a ringer for the Chili Cook-Off trivia team. And that's true, Rob, I'm sorry. But that, obviously that wasn't the only reason. Um, you know, there are a number of us who've had, had the privilege and the honor of serving as commentators, mission commentators in uh, mission control over the years. But very few of us have truly earned 
that iconic status of the voice of mission control. There were those distinctive and memorable voices from the past like Shorty Powers, Jack King, John McLeish, Jack Riley, Doug Ward, and others that followed throughout the shuttle program, including myself, who all contributed uniquely to this process of storytelling and sharing human spaceflight with the public. But if you ever listen to Rob call a launch or a landing, it's not just the voice you'll remember. You will remember the voice. I promise you that. But you'll also remember the mission. You'll also remember the crew. And you might remember most of the things that occurred on the way uphill or on the way back. Because Rob, Rob was a storyteller. And he, he, he shared this, this program in terms that people could embrace. His passion, his precision, and his gift for sharing the human spaceflight experience are absolutely second to none. His impact on public awareness and understanding of human spaceflight are immeasurable. Let's take a look. This is Mission Control Houston. It has been uh, just over an hour since uh, Atlantis is landing at the Kennedy Space Center. For the last time in this room, this is Mission Control Houston. And with the first pick in the next round, of the Space Communicator Award, our NASA selects Rob Navius. How is everyone? What a night. Never thought I'd ever follow Jeff Carr and space poop at the same time, but uh, I finally made it to the big leagues, right? Members of the R NASA Foundation, the Rotary Club, distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends. 56 years ago, a kid growing up in the Bronx in New York went shopping with his father to a Radio Shack store. That kid received a gift of a small Toshiba transistor radio, no bigger than the holster that holds your smartphone today. That kid was me, a month after John F. Kennedy was inaugurated president. Three months later, on the night of April 12, 1981, 1961, my dad, my mother, and I sat around the kitchen table in our apartment in the Bronx, listening to that radio over dinner as the legendary Lowell Thomas announced on the CBS radio network Evening News that Yuri Gagarin had launched as the first human in space. Even at the age of 12, I recognized the power and the impact of that moment, partly through my instincts and my love for current events, partly through the wonder of radio, through the wonder of the spoken word. Three weeks later, I took that transistor radio to class at PS86 in the Bronx on a Friday morning and sat in the back of the room listening to CBS radio's coverage of Alan Shepard's ride aboard Freedom 7 to become the first American to fly in space. It was only a month into a baseball season like no other in which Roger Maris and Mickey Mantle began their pursuit of Babe Ruth's home run record, Maris and Mantle. 
That was nirvana for a space nut like myself. But the daring do of Gagarin and Shepard? Kidding me? That was something else. I was hooked on space as if it was some exotic narcotic. I was jealous that I had to wait for Walter Cronkite to report the news every night that he knew what was going on in the world before I did. That was the exotic narcotic of news, journalism, and broadcasting that lured me into a career I could have never imagined possible. Covering the Patty Hearst kidnapping, the People's Temple mass suicides, the San Francisco City Hall assassinations, four presidential campaigns, Super Bowls, the Summer Olympics of 1984, natural disasters, and space. Those were the punctuation marks of my career in broadcasting. And to ultimately be involved in coverage of the space program for NASA? From the Bronx to Baikonur, from KSC to Kazakhstan, well, it is better to be lucky than it is to be good. Incredibly, my career has spanned the heights of human triumph and the depths of human failure, the cheers and the tears of human endeavor. It is called the sublime symmetry of history. But whether triumph or tragedy, it all came down to communicating the news, relaying the information to the media and to the public in very clear, unambiguous words. Coming from a wire service radio network background, you learned very quickly that you, no one else but you, were the singular authority for the dissemination of information. You had to be correct all the time. You had to report the facts and let the public decide for itself how to interpret that information. And most importantly, you could never, ever be wrong. Even today, a half century after I began my career at a small radio station in Bridgeport, Connecticut, that fundamental responsibility to report accurately every single time follows me as my Bible of broadcasting. In an era where communications has become somewhat impersonal, the art of broadcasting and the tablets of journalism are threatened like never before. Reading a book is passe. The skills required to hold a conversation with another person are becoming extinct. Writing is fast becoming a lost art. Yet we have so many more adventures to tell in humankind's endless journey to the stars. Today, no more and no less than the solemn responsibility I had more than a half century ago to tell other stories of conquest, triumph, and tragedy, we are still the stewards of the same responsibility to ensure that we communicate clearly and unambiguously armed with an arsenal of information with which to provide context and meaning to a whole new worldwide audience out there, who, by the way, has the same thirst for space exploration as I did so many decades ago. When Atlantis landed at the Kennedy Space Center almost six years ago, closing out the iconic space shuttle program, I was privileged to have had the honor to report to the world that the space shuttle had fired the imagination of a generation. Dear friends and colleagues, it's time to light that fire again through words that matter. Through clear, unambiguous communications, we can not only light that fire, but stoke it into a wildfire of wonderment. John F. Kennedy told us in his inaugural address in 1961 that the torch has been passed to a new generation. Well, it's time to use that torch to reignite that fire for yet another new generation as we punch through the veil of low Earth orbit. And in doing so, we can tell the world of our new journey to the stars. But we must do so with words that matter clearly and unambiguously. That's the touchstone of my career, the touchstone of so many journalists who preceded me and who laid the groundwork for our ability to use the First Amendment to inform and educate the world. For all the miles I have traveled in the pursuit of reporting, there are many, many more miles to go. Never forget, dear friends, that the power of the spoken word that moved me so much on the night of April 12, 1961, remains the lifeblood, the epicenter of communications, which is so very, very crucial in all of our lives. It moved me and it can move all of us in the days and the decades to come to venture forth and explore new worlds that we once only read about in the history books. 
Now we can write new history books and once again pass the torch. Thank you again for this incredible honor. I will cherish it forever. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Jeez, Rob. What do I say? You know, Rob is, Rob is a man of many words. There are so many words and so little time when it comes to Rob, really, when you think about it. When I was covering launches for CNN, that, that was, those remarks are beautiful. Uh, when I was covering launches for CNN, the producers insisted that um, I weigh in and say something whenever the PAO on console would take a pause or a break. <laughs> the problem with Navy is, of course, that never happened. <laughs> so I just, I just eventually just gave up and just started. I was just a viewer like all of you. And, um, um, but seriously, this, this man is poetic. I, I pulled one little piece. Uh, this is from STS 121. I can't do the full Rob Navy. I should probably bring him back up here for this. Discovery now flying on the singular power of its three liquid fuel main engines, draining half a ton of fuel per second from its fuel tank. All three engines are humming along with the three power producing fuel cells. Discovery straight as an arrow, speeding to a date with the International Space Station on Thursday. That is friggin' poetry, Rob Navius. That is friggin' poetry. It just comes out. It just, just, just there. It's there. He's got more. He can do it all night long. He once described the external fuel tank as butterscotch colored. So not only could I not get a word in edgewise, I was hungry. But of all the things that Rob Navius has said in his role as PAO at NASA, and Lord knows he said a lot of things, we all know his all-time favorite line is probably yours as well. Houston is now in control. So welcome, Rob Navius, to our elite band of communicators. We are proud to have you in the club. Secret handshake lessons over a single ball later. Thank you. and. Congratulations to you. Let's move on to the Stellar Awards, shall we? The Stellar Awards recognize people behind the scenes of the space program who are making outstanding contributions to its success and who are vital to the future of the nation's space effort. This year, there were 114 individuals, 34 teams, for a total of 148 nominations, and 23 different organizations from across industry, NASA, and the Department of Defense. We'd like to thank our stellar ranking team of Dr. Glenn Lunny, Arnie Aldrich, Colonel Eileen Collins, Captain Mike Coates for uh, the laborious and difficult task of ranking uh, candidates. As Arnie explained to me, it always happens right around tax time. It's really a pain in the butt. But um, only a few can be winners tonight, but they really should all be congratulated. I, I, they have ribbons or something on them? I don't, whatever it is, give them a hug or something. Um, do that. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to invite two of our nation's astronauts to the podium to present the Stellar Awards. We are joined by uh, a crew surgeon, flight engineer, mission specialist, spacewalker, veteran of the Expedition 44 and 45 with 141 days of space. He is the only man to play bagpipes in space. We are told after the performance, his crewmates voted, either he or the instrument had to go out the airlock. He's joined by a spacewalker and a veteran of Expedition 4849, 115 days in space, and 30 huge minutes in the Oval Office. Please welcome Shell Lindgren and Kate Rubens to the stage. Thank you so much. You know, uh, my lovely wife, uh, Christy, is a violinist, and um, early on she shared with me a, a performance secret, a stage secret, and said, never follow a banjo. And uh, so we are following Rob Navius and Miles O'Brien, so I think we've just been banjoed. <laughs> um, we sure have. <laughs> uh, 
Wow, this is, uh, this is really fancy. It's kind of like the, the Academy Awards of uh, the space industry. And uh, you look very nice, Kate. Well, thank you. And I think I'm supposed to ask, uh, who are you wearing tonight? Oh, you know, this old thing. I actually prefer to wear ILC Dover, say, an EMU. Yes, nice. If I'm being completely honest. You don't look so half bad yourself. Uh, what's the last time you wore a tux? I couldn't tell you. Although the last time I went to a formal event, uh, I wore a kilt. So for those of you in the front row, you're welcome. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an honor for both of us to be here tonight to help present the Stellar Awards. And uh, Kate, it's a special honor to share the stage with you since we are classmates of the astronaut class of uh, 2009, affectionately known as the Chumps. And as astronauts, uh, we know firsthand that mission safety and success are due to the exceptional people who go above and beyond every day. The stellar nominees here tonight truly represent the best in our nation's space program. The stellar awards are important because they honor those who often work behind the scenes and whose careers and accomplishments may not be as visible as others. A panel of experts reviewed all the nominees' backgrounds and accomplishments to determine the significance of their contribution to our space program. The breadth and the scope of the nominees' work is truly amazing and proof positive that we have a wealth of unusually bright and talented people who are working to ensure that the space program has a very promising future. It takes the dedication and effort of thousands to get us into space, and tonight's nominees represent the best of our best. The contributions of all the folks involved in the space program, and particularly the stellar nominees we honor tonight, have created and sustained the capability and leadership in space that our nation relies on. At this time, we'd like to recognize the Stellar Award nominees by asking all of them to stand. Please join us in congratulating all of the nominees with a hearty round of applause. Now, in case you haven't noticed, all the Stellar Award nominees are wearing blue ribbons this evening so they can be recognized. So we're going to present the awards in four categories, and we'll ask all the winners in each category to come to the stage together to receive their awards. And names are going to be called in no particular order. Now, we are presenting awards in early career, mid-career, late career, and team categories. And within each of these groups, nominations were solicited from across the space industry for nominees involved in government and corporate programs, as well as those involved in human and unmanned, unmanned spaceflight activities. And as much as we'd like to, we are sorry to say we don't have enough time for each winner to make remarks, so you're just going to have to listen to us. Sorry about that. <laughs> Shall we get started? OK. So our first stellar awards will go to those who are in the early stages of their careers. There are seven winners in this category, selected from a field of 31 candidates. As I call the names of the winners in the early cate career category, I'd like them to join us at the foot of the stage. And please hold your applause until all of the winners have been announced. So the winner in the early career category is La La Land. All right. Oh, sorry, wrong envelope. Sorry, sorry about that. I'm so embarrassed. Um, the winners in the early career category are Chelsea Shepard of SGT, Joey Edgar of Oceaneering Space Systems, Russell Vela of the U.S. Air Force Research Laboratory, Peter Massey of Jacobs, Sarah Wallace of NASA's Johnson Space Center, Chris Eby of SpaceX, and Jason Shapiro of Aerojet Rocketdyne. Please come and join us at the base of the stairs. The first award goes to Chelsea Shepard of SGT for her outstanding dedication, leadership, and support to assembly and maintenance operations for the International Space Station.
Joey Edgar of Oceaneering Space Systems is recognized for outstanding technical knowledge, unwavering attention to detail, and exemplary work ethic in contributing to the development of extravehicular activity spaceflight hardware. <laughs> Russell Vela of the U.S. Air Force Research Laboratory is recognized for exceptional technical expertise in solving significant radar engineering challenges to support space vehicle design and major ground-based radio telescope upgrades. <laughs> Peter Massey of Jacobs is recognized for exceptional contributions which enable our continuous presence in low Earth orbit aboard the International Space Station and are shaping our capability of to extend human exploration to Mars and beyond. Sarah Wallace of NASA's Johnson Space Center is recognized for championing a game-changing biomolecule sequencer that was successfully demonstrated as a scientific tool on the International Space Station. Chris Eby of SpaceX is recognized for outstanding technical contributions and leadership overseeing the commercial crew spacesuit qualification milestone. And the final early career award goes to Jason Shapiro of Aerojet Rocket Dyne for outstanding leadership in testing of large rockets from the Antares AJ-26 to the Orion Jettison Motor. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join us in congratulating all of the stellar winners in the early career category. Congratulations to all of the Early Career Award winners. We have nine winners in the mid-career category selected from a field of 43 candidates. I'd like to invite to the foot of the stairs Kenneth Anderley of Jacobs, Lieutenant Colonel Rich Beckman of the United States Air Force, Nick Utley of the Boeing Company, Jeff Bemis of Orbital ATK, Bob Mazzi of NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Carolyn Overmeyer of Lockheed Martin, Chuck Seal of Aerojet Rocketdyne, Ronnie Backus of NASA Johnson Space Center, and Gary Lai of Blue Origin. Kenneth Anderley of Jacobs is recognized for exemplary service to JSC and the James Webb Space Telescope in promoting the advancement of space exploration. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Rich Beckman of the United States Air Force is recognized for exceptional program management and technical and programmatic problem solving leading to numerous successful classified military operations and GPS capabilities for a billion users worldwide. <laughs> Nick Utley of the Boeing Company is recognized for sustained superior performance in electrical wiring design and wiring installation for human spaceflight applications.
Jeff Bemis of Orbital ATK is recognized for outstanding leadership of the Orion Launch Abort Attitude Control Motor in reconstituting the team and guiding it through a successful critical design review. Bob Massey of NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratories is recognized for outstanding management of exceptionally successful projects exploring the solar system. <laughs> Carolyn Overmeyer of Lockheed Martin is recognized for technical excellence in managing the design and the development of the Orion Service Module. Chuck Seal of Aerojet Rocketdyne is recognized for invaluable contributions towards the 100% mission success of the Delta IV vehicle and RS-68 rocket engine through leadership, mentorship, technical excellence, and innovation. <laughs> Ronnie Backus of NASA Johnson Space Center is recognized for outstanding leadership of the Orion Heat Shield block bond verification effort. <laughs> and finally, Gary Lai of Blue Origin for outstanding leadership of the New Shepard technical team, which, out, which performed five launches and landings of the same booster in one year. Ladies and gentlemen, please congratulate all of the winners in the mid-career category. The final individual awards this evening go to those in the late career category. Of the 41 nominations received in this category, we have nine winners, and I'd like to invite all of them to the foot of the stage as their names are called. They are Mark Ferguson of Orbital ATK, Kenny Todd of NASA's Johnson Space Center, John Vollmer of the Boeing Company, Dr. Jeff Davis of NASA's Johnson Space Center, Michael Melgaris of Jacobs, Dale Cloud of UTC Aerospace Systems, Cam Gafarian of SGT, Mark Raymond of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and Scott McIntyre of the Boeing Company. Mark Ferguson of Orbital ATK is recognized for exceptional technical and program management of the pressurized cargo module of Cygnus. <laughs> Kenny Todd of NASA's Johnson Space Center is recognized for exceptional accomplishments and expertly and successfully leading day-to-day -day operations for the International Space Station. John Vollmer of the Boeing Company is recognized for outstanding dedication and leadership on the International Space Station, supporting NASA's mission to explore space and expand scientific research. <laughs> Dr. Jeff Davis of NASA's Johnson Space Center is recognized for exceptional career innovations and collaborative leadership as director of NASA's Human Health 
and Performance Directorate, greatly impacting agency strategic goals. Michael Mulgaris of Jacobs is recognized for exceptional technical and team leadership during an accomplished career from Apollo to multi-purpose crew vehicle Orion. <laughs> Dale Cloud of UTC Aerospace Systems is recognized for exceptional technical skill and leadership in engineering for the development of systems and components for both human and unmanned space. <laughs> Cam Gaffarian of Stinger Gaffarian Technologies Incorporated is recognized for being a visionary serial entrepreneur dedicated to creating companies that operate with the highest level of integrity, promote employee well-being, and deliver the best technical solutions to their customers. Mark Raymond of, the, of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory is recognized for extraordinary and uniquely creative work to explore the solar system and open the frontiers of space to even more ambitious mission, missions to follow. The final late career award goes to Scott McIntyre of the Boeing Company for exceptional leadership, sustained excellent performance, and dedication to the advancement of human spaceflight programs. Please join me in congratulating all the winners in the late career category. The final stellar award category is the Team Awards. This year, the Foundation received 34 nominations in this category. Seven winners were selected from this very high quality list. I'd like to ask the team representative for the following teams to come forward and be recognized. New Shepherd Team of Blue Origin. <laughs> Dawn Flight Team of NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Falcon 9 Team of SpaceX. EVA 35 Recovery Team from UTC Aerospace Systems. Global Positioning 2F System of the United States Air Force. ISS Oxygen Generator Assembly Recovery Team of the Boeing Company. And Next Generation Cygnus Design Team of Orbital ATK. The New Shepherd team of Blue Origin is recognized for the outstanding accomplishments in performing the first landing of a vertical launch rocket in history, and then four subsequent launches and landings in 2016. Accepting for the team is Rob Meyerson. The Dawn Flight Team of NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory is recognized for exemplary achievement in exploring some of the last uncharted worlds in the inner solar system in a unique mission that reveals new insights about the dawn of the solar system. Accepting for the team is Mark Raymond.
The Falcon 9 team of SpaceX is recognized for an exceptional history of innovative and high quality spacecraft launch and vehicle designs for NASA, industry, and other government organizations. Accepting for the team is John Edwards. The EVA 35 recovery team of UTC Aerospace Systems is recognized for outstanding rapid performance to recover EVA capability on ISS after US EVA 35 water in the helmet incident. Accepting for the team is Robert Rosado. The Global Positioning System 2F team of the United States Air Force is recognized for successful acquisition, development, and delivery of 12 GPS space satellites to orbit, ensuring gold standard positioning, navigation, and timing capabilities to over 2.7 million military personnel, one of a billion civilian users, and 57 allied nations worldwide. Accepting for the team is Lieutenant Colonel Brian Vesey. The ISS Oxygen Generator Assembly Recovery Team of the Boeing Company is recognized for successful resolution of complex and emerging issues resulting from the Oxygen Generator Assembly Recovery that threatened ISS oxygen generation capability and potential ISS decrew or delaying Soyuz launch due to depleted oxygen supplies. Accepting for the team is Steve Van Curen. And this evening's final team award recognizes the next generation Cygnus design team of Orbital ATK for outstanding technical leadership and teamwork in the design and manufacturing of the next generation Cygnus spacecraft, resulting in increased capability, reliability, and science and utilization for the ISS. Accepting for the team is Keith Davies. Please join us as we congratulate all of the winners in the team category. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you're all going to agree that tonight's stellar award winners represent the very best of the thousands of people working in our space program. We could truly be proud of all the stellar award nominees, for they are all winners and give us hope for the future. Thank you. What, no bagpipes? We couldn't get a little concert? All right, let's get to the main event. You know, the world is filled with awards. We've got Oscars, we've got Emmys, Grammys, Golden Globes, Country Music Association, Nobels, Pulitzers, Webbies, MT, Vid v, Video Music, People's Choice, Teen Choice, Miss America, Food Photographer of the Year. You knew about that one? World Beer Cup, and the big one, the Regional Railroad of the Year. You know about that one? That's just to name a few. I'm not even mentioning sports. Should I do that one? No, let's not do that. Suffice to say, there is nothing quite like this award, the Space Trophy, Space Trophy. But shouldn't we give it a name? How about Spacey? No, it doesn't work. Actually, if I had to vote on this, in all seriousness, I would call it Max. Not just because space takes things to the max or Max Q, but also in honor of its first recipient, the late, great Maxime Faget. He won in 1987. <laughs> And as I said before, it's been downhill ever since. Uh, not true, of course, but an illustrious group actually has followed, and tonight, of course, is the 31st presentation of the award. The trophy is presented each year uh, to the person who is judged by his or her peers to have made the most significant contribution to the U.S. space program. 
only U.S. citizens can receive this award. We have been informed by our friends at ICE that due to increased immigration enforcement, there will be a thorough check of Mr. Grunsfeld's papers, his comings, his goings, his cell phone calls, and his browser history. If anything comes up fishy, we have some members of the Chicago Aviation Police Department here to drag his sorry out of his seat and get him out into the hallway. The recipient is selected by a vote of the Foundation's Board of Advisors. The votes are tabulated by an independent accounting firm, and we have been assured that the envelope management system is superior to those at the Oscars. Now, just before I came on stage, our producer, Mark Havican, told me we have a special little something to share with everyone. Let's roll the video. Greetings to everyone at the Arnasa Gala. Hey, John, congratulations on receiving the National Space Trophy. What a great honor. Your dedication to scientific achievement through your career has resulted in amazing discoveries that everyone at NASA can be proud of. As an astrophysicist, an astronaut, and a senior leader, you helped unlock the mysteries of space and champion the best that science and engineering working together can achieve. John, you and your Hubble crewmates flew higher than anyone since Apollo, so you know how great the view is from up here. We see all those tall mountains you love to climb. We would wave if we were passing over Houston, but instead, we'll just say good night and have fun. All right, give it up for Peggy. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're honored to have among us uh, an engineer, a physicist, a private pilot, and a former NASA administrator with seven advanced degrees, which is equal to the set of underwear I own, labeled by the days of the week, by the way. He once told a reporter who asked him a stupid question, I can explain it to you, but I cannot understand it for you. <laughs> and that was not me. It was not me, I swear. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for the great Mike Griffin. Now, Miles, you have to admit, it could have been you. <laughs> I mean, it could very easily have been you. You were, you were one question away from it being you. <laughs> I would suggest that we all give Miles a hand for his performance tonight, but that would almost be tacky. More seriously, I want to thank uh, our NASA and um, especially John Grunsfeld for asking me to uh, introduce him here tonight and, uh, and for having me here. I've had a, a long and, and very, very lucky career in the space business, um, but Houston has always been the most special place for me, um, being the home of, of the people who enable space exploration, human space exploration, to take place. I think that if I took everything out of my career except my experiences working with people from the Houston space community, I would still have a very, very, very fortunate career. So thank you all. But uh, it's now my pleasure to spend a few minutes talking about um, John Grunsfeld. Uh, that's easy to do. The trouble is, the difficulty is to keep it in the five to seven minutes that they allotted me to do that. Um, let me start by saying what a unique role that I think John has exemplified in the years that he has been at NASA and the years that I've known him. Um, we have heard since the dawn of the space program about controversies between people who want uh, our nation's tax dollars to be spent uh, prosecuting scientific discovery, unmanned spaceflight, it used to be called in those less enlightened times. And then we've had another contingent that believes that human exploration of, of the new frontier 
uh, still a new frontier, is the most important thing to be doing with the money that we as a nation can afford to spend on space. And there has been, that I can remember, uh, 60 years of arguing uh, between these two camps. Uh, John Grunsfeld is a person who marries those two camps, and he does it elegantly, and he does it professionally, and he does it with expertise which is beyond superlative. Um, a truly veteran astronaut of five space flights and a true believer in the value and importance of human space exploration, uh, John is also a person who has been a chief scientist at NASA, uh, the head of NASA's science program in a separate incarnation as associate administrator for space science or the science mission director at NASA. And he's been the deputy at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, three of his space flights have involved repairing the Hubble Space Telescope uh, something which holds a particular affinity for me because back when I used to do useful work, I once worked on the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, it, is, it is today one of my own most honored accomplishments to have been part of producing the Hubble. Uh, John was part of making the Hubble better, not once but three times. Um, Many years ago, in testimony supporting the building of the superconducting supercollider, which regrettably did not occur, um, Leon Letterman testified uh, on its behalf to the Congress of the United States. And Dr. Letterman, uh, when asked if the superconducting supercollider uh, had any relationship or would do anything for the defense of the United States, Dr. Letterman responded, no, it's one of the things that make it worth defending. I think those of us here would recognize the core truth of that statement, and certainly if in, if in John's career he had done nothing but succor the Hubble Space Telescope in its many hours of need, he would still be worthy of tonight's recognition, but he has done so much more. I think it is safe to say you would not have a future Mars program today without John's efforts as head of the science mission directorate. The other thing that I must say tonight is that John has done all of this with a surpassing modesty and degree of self-effacement. He's one of the most capable people that I know in arenas ranging from music to mountain climbing to flying airplanes to, oh, never mind, being an astronomer and an astronaut and, and a manager of a major piece of NASA. But you would never hear about any of these accomplishments from him. You have to hear about them from other people. Um, you actually have to probe a little bit to find out all of the things that he's done. No one has yet received the Our NASA Award twice in his or her career. Uh, so I'm gonna conclude by suggesting that I suspect the first person to do so will be John after his tenure as NASA Administrator, which lies still in his future. <laughs> thank you all for having me here tonight. John, thank you for asking me to speak on your behalf. And with that, I think uh, John, can you step forward, please?
I may have gotten a little out of sequence, not unusual for me, but John, we still want you up here. Ladies and gentlemen, John Grunsfeld. Wow. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, thank you, RNASA Foundation, the staff, the board of directors, and the many generous sponsors, and congratulations to all the other award winners tonight. Uh, this really is a stellar evening. Uh, Michael, thank you very much for the, the kind introduction. Uh, you have been a friend, a colleague, uh, an inspiration, uh, and uh, hopefully you doomed my career as future NASA administrator. Uh, <laughs> because I do remember you had black hair and you had hair before you were NASA administrator. <laughs> a little too late for me. Uh, thank you, Miles O'Brien. And, and one of the things uh, that we didn't want to know about Miles O'Brien is that he has underwear identified by the day. Um, but there is something you, that some, mo most of you, I hope, know about Miles O'Brien, but many of you probably don't, is that Miles helped us learn how to repair the advanced camera for surveys on the Hubble Space Telescope in 2008 as he's the only uh, reporter ever to dive in the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory uh, and work on the Hubble Space Telescope. And thank you, Miles, for you know, all of your wonderful reporting and your support uh, and communication. I also want to thank Rob Navius, and I'm going to go off script, which is always dangerous, but uh, Rob and I have a, a special bond, uh, not just because he was the voice of NASA for my missions, um, and the good news is I was on board, I didn't have to listen. Uh, <laughs> but more importantly, a project that we did on my second space flight, STS-81, uh, which I'm remembered as the Hubble repairman, and it is a true story that in a conversation with President Obama from uh, 600 kilometers, 350 miles above Earth, traveling 17,500 miles an hour, uh, some folks in the room were there. Uh, we talked to the president, Scott Altman and myself, and the first thing he asked is, uh, can you see Chicago? Uh, and we said yes. And he said, would you please check on my lawn? <laughs> Which Scott Altman said, okay, we'll do that. Uh, and then he turned to me and he said, you know, uh, are we talking to John Grunsfeld? And, he, and I said yes. And he said, oh, you're the Hubble repairman. And suddenly I felt like we'd risen a few kilometers up in the Earth's uh, orbit. And after his classic pregnant pause, the president said, not to be confused with the Maytag repairman. Uh, but fortunately, that did give me another attempt at a, a further career. But Rob Navius and I uh, actually sparred a little bit before the flight on STS-81. This was a flight to the Mir space station, the fifth flight. And we were taking Jerry Leninger up and returning John Blaha. And uh, I had this sort of crazy idea, it was crazy at the time, uh, to call car talk from space. <laughs> well, NASA at the time was very reticent to be involved in anything having to do with humor. Um, <laughs> it's risky. I mean, space flight wasn't that risky, but talking about to a couple of comedians was risky. But. Uh, but they're both MIT grads, and I'm an MIT alum, and I actually did work in their garage when I was a college student. I did, you know, they weren't famous then. Uh, I wasn't famous then, and I you know, wasn't famous when I flew on STS-81, and I'm not that famous now. But I did work in their garage, and I had invited them to the launch, and their producer called and said, sorry, they don't like to travel. And I just thought that was very odd. But we got into a nice conversation, and Anyway, Rob was uh, a partner with us on that, that journey to STS-81, and we did call Car Talk from space, and that's probably what I'm best known for, is calling Car Talk from the space shuttle. But the important part of this long story is that afterwards, we did our crew brief, uh, and to senior staff, George Abbey was the center director at the time, and Rob was there at the table, and, and Mike Baker, and Brent Jett, and Marsh Ivins, and myself, and Jeff Weisshoff. We had view graphs back then, and I was the view graph flipper. <laughs> and it was a quick brief, and afterwards, George Abbey said, Mr. Abbey said, does anybody have anything else? And of course, nobody had anything else. It was a, it was a good flight. Uh, and he pulled out a little tape recorder and pushed play, a cassette recorder. And I actually know because I had one, an old Bell and Howell from circa 1975 or so, 74. And he played the whole car talk interview. 
And he turned to Rob Navius and he said, good job. But that's, that's not the interesting part of the story. As we're walking out, and how many of you know George Abbey? Yeah, I thought, I thought so. As we're walking out, you know, one by one, he's shaking hands with us. He leans into me and he says, next time, let's do car talk. <laughs> I was elated. For those of you who know George Abbey, uh, I said, there's going to be a next time. <laughs> so thank you, Rob Navius, and congratulations. I want to thank uh, my family, most of all, and Carol Grunsfeld is here in the audience. My daughter, Sarah, is not here. She's at school, uh, which is where she should be, and my son, Mace, as well. My, my parents, who are no longer with us, my sister, Marsha. Uh, you know, I was inspired by so many people, many of whom are in the room, uh, many of whom are our NASA uh, awardees, uh, John Young in particular. When I was uh, in grade school, I carried a little Gemini lunchbox to school. I had about that time declared to my mother that I wanted to be an astronaut, and she thought that was great. It meant I would study science and math, and there was absolutely no chance I would ever become an astronaut. Um, and so it was that inspiration value, uh, and I certainly showed her. Um, I was kind of a picky eater as a kid, and she said, well, when you're in space, what will you eat? And I said, Captain Crunch. <laughs> for five space shuttle flights before launch, I ate Captain Crunch every time for breakfast. By the way, I had a similar conversation with my wife 30 years ago when we first uh, started dating, and she said, well, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, I want to be an astronaut. I don't think she believed me either. Uh, it's been living hell ever since. <laughs> I want to thank my friends and colleagues, and in particular Matt Mountain of the Space Telescope Science Institute, uh, a dear friend and uh, a great scholar, a great leader, and, and he couldn't be here tonight, but uh, thank you very much. Um, Earlier, we had some stellar awards and we had some team awards, and there's absolutely no doubt that, uh, you know, I'm touched by this award, but it is a team award. And the team is the incredible NASA team, uh, the flight control team, the engineering team, the Hubble Space Telescope team, our contractors, our partners in academia. But there's a special bond that astronauts have with their crewmates. And I would just like uh, the crewmates who are here, I know Mike Good is here, I know Marsha Ivins is here, I know Greg Johnson is here, if you'd just stand up for a moment so I can thank you. And if, if anybody else that I missed is here, <laughs> Megan MacArthur is here. <laughs> Megan, I didn't see you, I need a hug. Thank you very much. I also want to thank the American people. I mean, how incredible is it that we get to do what we do uh, on behalf of the American people, uh, that we get to explore space, that we get to unravel the mysteries of the universe, and we get to share that knowledge, not with just the rest of the country, but everyone on planet Earth. I, I view our space explorations at NASA and our goals at NASA to innovate, explore, discover, and inspire. And we do that to answer some fundamental questions about ourselves, about our universe. Where did we come from? Where did the universe come from? Uh, where did the atoms that we're made out of come from? And we are learning those stories. It is a story. How did the solar system form? How did life form on Earth? Where are we going? What's the trajectory of planet Earth in the future? Not just the distant future, but the near future. Pretty important question. What's the fate of the universe? And where are we as the human species going? Are we just gonna stay here on Earth or are we gonna reach out? Are we gonna explore? The answer is yes, we are. And the question that's fascinating me most of late is the question of are we alone? Is there life beyond Earth in our solar system, in the universe? Uh, and I'll take a quick poll because it's fun. Uh, and I'm not gonna ask how many of you think we're alone in the universe a compound question, how many of you think we're not alone in the universe and that we will find out in the next 20 years? All of space is a human endeavor. Our robotic explorers, Curiosity on Mars, Curiosity has a Twitter account, Curiosity is a she, a lot of us follow her. The Dawn spacecraft, the Hubble Space Telescope, I mean, you name it. All of those observatories, 
don't discover anything. Pluto New Horizons didn't discover anything. People here on Earth discover things using these robotic tools. It's a human achievement. We are very good at creating these innovative missions that explore, discover. We're not so good at celebrating these achievements. And I want to again thank our NASA for working so hard to recognize, honor, and celebrate these achievements in space. Not just those few things I've done, but the few things, the many things uh, that we all do and the other awardees. These efforts occur because of the incredible skills of a very large group of dedicated people in the NASA family. I've come to conclude that NASA is really a cult. <laughs> the call to explore space draws people in. It incites them to work long hours, insanely long hours, and make sacrifices that at time seems well over the top. Anybody experience that? Any of <laughs> the family members here think that? Why do we do these mighty things? Because it's important. Because it's about humanity's future. Because it is essential to our economy, human health, national defense, and inspiring a nation. Because the inspiration, the wonder and awe that NASA missions generate is what drives us all. 55 years ago, not far from where we are tonight, President John F. Kennedy spoke these words, all too famous words. And I know you've heard this over and over again, but I couldn't help myself. We choose <laughs> to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things not because they are easy, but because they are hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one we are willing to accept and one we are unwilling to postpone and one which we intend to win. And we have been winning ever since. We lead the world in space and earth science. We lead the world in human exploration. We got our start with Apollo and our incredible lunar missions. Our amazing space shuttle powered us towards to hone our skills in space with reliable, reusable space systems. We perfected space robotics. We refined space walking to a fine art. Uh, and I think with Hubble to you know, an incredible state where we were removing tiny screws and pulling circuit boards in space. With our space and earth science program, we have unraveled the mysteries of the universe, understanding our sun in greater detail, Mercury, Venus, much about the earth, some of which is very disturbing, our moon, Mars, you know, on out into the solar system with Juno at Jupiter now, Cassini doing some incredible gymnastics at the end of its remarkable mission. Uh, and of course, New Horizons and beyond. The Hubble Space Telescope, are the most powerful scientific instrument ever created by humans. And we're just getting started. In fact, this week is Hubble's 27th anniversary in space. Happy birthday, Hubble. <laughs> On the International Space Station, we have not only shown that it serves to organize and measure the best of our energies, but to bring together the best efforts of nations around the world. Of course, there is still much work to be done and challenges ahead of us in the exploration of space. But I really do believe the prospects are incredibly bright. For the first time in human history, we have a number of new capabilities coming online for exploration. The Space Launch System to take us further out into the solar system with human ex explorers, scientists, and engineers. We will soon have the capability to send planetary scientists and astrobiologists to the surface of Mars. And the Curiosity lander uh, rover has shown us that Mars was once habitable and that it has all the ingredients of life, that it had the chemistry that could have enabled life. And we're seeing signs of organics and signatures that look very confusing uh, to us that could be even fossil evidence of past life. 
and it's going to take Mars 2020 and further investigations. But I think human explorers is when we're going to make the most progress. We have the Orion spacecraft. We have commercial crew transportation. We have new heavy lift vehicles such as the Blue Origin, New Glenn, and Falcon Heavy uh, coming online. And that just adds to what is a remarkably reliable stable of launch vehicles, the Atlas V and Delta IV. There's some developments you probably don't know much about, things like the Venture Class Launch System, a new small class of launchers that's going to enable a whole new generation of science capabilities uh, in low Earth orbit and maybe even to the moon. For the first time in human history, we have efforts and work to answer that question, are we alone in the universe? Perhaps the James Webb Space Telescope will get us a little bit further, looking at the atmospheres of planets around nearby stars, launching October 2018. The Mars 2020 rover is going to cache samples for return to Earth that, who knows, could contain inclusions inside of those rocks that will tell us that life did exist on Mars about the same time life started on Earth. The Europa Clipper will sail through plumes of water from an under ice ocean that has been sitting there percolating, a warm, salty ocean with organics and connections to undersea vents for four and a half billion years. If life isn't that hard to get started, there's probably life there. And we're going to sail through those plumes and see if we can detect those signs of life. A lander on Europa is just in the works, getting started. In 2018, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite is going to launch that's going to tell us where all our nearest neighbor planets are uh, that are Earth-sized with atmospheres. And we know how to build a new telescope beyond James Webb that really would have the capabilities to analyze the atmospheres of planets, Earth-like planets around nearby stars, and see signs of life if they exist, whether it's an early Earth or a late Earth. And I think we're going to have humans building those telescopes. This bright future is not without challenges. To create that future, we need to dare mighty things, to undertake high performance challenges. We need to be bold and audacious, not incremental. We need strong and technically capable leadership. And we need to be willing to make big decisions and to take risks. I personally believe our next frontier for human exploration is the exploration of Mars. We have the knowledge, the capability, the resources, the vehicles to embark on this next grand adventure. But perhaps the most important challenge of all that we need to address for space exploration and all other progress in this country is to support and improve our nation's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education efforts. In the end, this may be the most important challenge of all. I'm optimistic and excited about our future in space and on Earth. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for awarding me the Rotary National Award for Space Achievement. I'm truly honored and humbled. Thank you very much. going to leave that trophy behind. You know, one thing uh, I'd like to add about that, uh, that trip into the MBL, the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory, uh, if you'll recall, I, I, when I did that, I was working for CNN, and then that mission got delayed by quite some time. Um, by the time the mission flew, I was no longer with CNN. Uh, I had been dumped. So, um, <clears throat> in fact, the entire science and technology unit got dumped because we knew nothing about the Kardashians. So, um, and I felt a little bit bad about that uh, because all that material that I shot of me doing laps in the pool and all the things you got to do was no longer my property. However, everything shot underwater was public domain NASA footage. So I did put together a little piece, it's on YouTube, you can search it, of me actually doing the PGT with him and, and in the Hubble. It was pretty awesome. And the reason I bring this up, not just to brag, but that was a good brag actually, but um, is throughout his career, uh, John has always gone out of his way
to do what he can to communicate the wonderment of what you all do in space. And it's hard sometimes to come up with words that work. Um, you know, we, we try as journalists, as you heard Rob trying to tell the story, but these are the guys who, I mean, there aren't many beats you cover where you can't go to the location. This is one of them. And he's always done a great job in trying to share it with others. And for that, I commend him. Um, give him another round of applause for that. <clears throat> so, it has now been 60 years since Omega rolled out its venerable Speedmaster watch. This is like the Home Shopping Channel right now. <laughs> As many of you know, uh, in 1963, it became the first watch to pass NASA's rigorous testing for flight qualification. And, and some guy just went to a jewelry place in Houston, bought some watches, and, and that was the one that passed. Our next speaker flew in space just a couple years later, Gemini 6A. You say Gemini or Gemini? It used to be Gemini. Now it's Gemini? What do you do? Gemini or Gemini? We'll ask this guy. He wouldn't know. Please give a warm welcome to one of the great prides of Oklahoma, one of the all-time greatest aviators ever, and a generally awesome guy. Uh, he has a little surprise from Omega for our honoree tonight. I don't want to surprise it and you know, ruin the surprise and spoil it, but he does have a surprise. Give it up for Lieutenant General Thomas P. Stafford. Thank you, Miles. And again, it's the real honor for the Omega Watch Corporation to support our NASA and to present uh, this professional speedmaster to John Grunsfeld. Congratulations on the National Space Award, John. An outstanding career as an astronaut, and then later on, Associate Administrator of NASA, and uh, you've done so much to help. I'd like to make a couple of observations. As we looked at the Stella Award winners and all the people here, we have so much talent in this country, yet at times we take dips. And as Mike Griffin found out as NASA Administrator, and I'm sure you have found as the Associate Administrator for Science, that with political ups and downs, it, does, it makes it go slower. And we could have been a lot farther but we've had some major setbacks, and most of it is political, and then also maybe a few ideas by people over in OMB <laughs> on what we have to do. But uh, this, um, and I gave congressional testimony to the House Science, Space, and Tech Committee in February in their opening uh, hearing session, and my main plea was let's have some consistency in this and continual support and not up and down. And this is what. <laughs> we have come a long way so, in this period of time, but think how much farther we could be or how much farther we could go if we have consistent support. And that, this is the main plea. But uh, we have great people. And John, you've exemplified on the Hubble telescope and those repairs and the, in your job there as associate administrator. The uh, Hubble telescope has a special meaning for me too. <clears throat> My first quote volunteer job that Dan Golden hit me up for was to chair the oversight committee for the International Space Station. And my executive secretary was Bill Vantine there. And, uh, the main thing was not technical. We had to do some real head knocking in management. But uh, we got it done. And uh, in fact, I had to give testimony because, the again, the science committee doubted that we could repair that uh, a telescope, which is one of the greatest instruments ever invented. But uh, I told them we'd carry out 95% of the primary and probably 80 85% of the secondary. We did 100% of the primary and probably 110% of the secondaries. And it continued on through those servicing missions. And you did a super job. We're so proud of you. And so congratulations and 
Again, our marketing people made a big box for a small watch. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, back, uh, uh, Miles mentioned that it was 60 years ago this year that the professional Speedmaster was perfected, and out five years later, Wally Shira wore it, and then all the way through uh, Gemini, Apollo, Skylab, Apollo Soyuz, and the, the first series of shuttle flights. So it's, it's a great watch, and uh, it's still say it's now an antique, but it works real well. <laughs> but it'll keep great time for you, John. But remember, wind it every morning. <laughs> Congratulations again. Well deserved. General, thank you very much. Uh, this would have been very useful actually on the spacewalks because I had a tendency to go a little long. <laughs> Might good too. Older I get, the more I need to get wound in the morning too. So feeling a little antique too. All right, now for a few, oh, and by the way, I think he settled it, Gemini. We're going with Gemini here, folks. And now for some uh, words from our sponsors. I want to acknowledge Task, an Angility company for sponsoring the portrait of John Grunsfeld by the artist Pat Rawlings. It's on the cover of your program, and there's the, the original is out in the hallway. It will reside uh, with the six-foot space trophy at the uh, Space Center Houston for the next year. Let us acknowledge all the sponsoring organizations who provided special support for tonight's dinner. These organizations will be displayed on the screen. Wherever you can support them, please do buy a rocket from them or something. <laughs> anyway. Have a great evening. Thank you for your time. We enjoyed you being here, and we'll see you next year. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Rotary National Award for Space Achievement Foundation, I extend our sincerest congratulations to our honorees. All of you deserve our admiration and our gratitude. At this time, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Miles O'Brien for doing a great job as MC again. Let's hear it for Miles, please. And as a reminder, NASA TV will air tonight's event at 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Central next Tuesday, May 2nd. And finally, the foundation, We'd like to give a special thanks to Omega Watch, the Fisher Space Pins for their in-kind donation, TASC for the portrait, Orbital ATK for the uh, Stellar Awards, and truly, our NASA is grateful to all our sponsors whose support and achievements make this event possible and give us something to celebrate. From the bottom of our hearts, thank you. So this is the conclusion of our program. Thank you very much for being here. Keep up all the good work. Please drive safely. Have a good night. <laughs>